and on today's show, how deferred compensation can generate sales opportunities for existing plans. Part 5 of this week's series on deferred compensation with Regional Vice President of Business Owner and Executive Solutions, Sherry Flint. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician in Innsmark. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to day five. Boy, you've Thanks, survived Steve. with, yeah, you're on our set here with, with um, Sherry Flint. Sherry, you've been in the business 28 years. We've been talking about deferred comp. You're in so many other areas. We're just talking about it this week. We're introducing you to deferred compensation. If you're coming in a Friday show and you haven't seen anything in the front end, you need to just go back out and watch it in succession. I think watching it in chronology will really help your tutorial experience. So what today I want to talk about opportunities. Now, a lot of people say, well, yesterday we talked about, hey, let's just start from ground zero and bring a brand new plan mm -hmm. into the idea. But what happens when people have things already online? Can I actually improve it? And in your experience, if you walk into existing plans, can we make that much of an impact? Has the way we do this, has it changed so much in the 90s, since the 90s? You know, I would say in the last two or three years, what we want to look for as an advisor, we want to look for companies that have had a plan in place, even if it's only two or three years old, there might be something that they're missing. So we want to look at plan design. We want to look at financing. Were they explained all three different financing mm -hmm. choices and did they, they make the right decision or has that changed over time? So just like a policy review or a 401k plan review or anything else we do in the mm -hmm. financial planning space, you want to review plans every two or three years and make sure they're current, up to date, they have the features and benefits you're looking for. And from this, because it's a, a, a retirement plan, we want to make sure there's education and communication mm -hmm. and good participation. So there's a lot of an impact that an advisor can have with an existing deferred compensation okay, so plan. When I'm looking at something like this, what is the reason why the employer wants to do a review? Why would he want to do a review? Administration. Oftentimes, it comes right down to administration, just like a 401k plan. I'm not happy with my advisor, I haven't seen him in a couple of years, or I'm just not getting the benefits out of the plan that I need. It could be, it might not even be the person doing the administration, it might mm -hmm. be there's no education or communication. It might be, I don't have a full list of investment choices. So we're gonna look at the whole thing holistically, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, it's not working for the plan sponsor. It might not be working for the HR person. So they're looking for something simple, easy, and turnkey, right? We want a simple but mm -hmm. effective benefit program. As an advisor, I, I'm in there now, and he's agreeing that, hey, he'd like it to be reviewed. When I'm look, going through the review process, and of course you have, uh, at principal, you guys have support people for mm -hmm. personnel for this, so we can walk through there and put people online and walk through the whole first. Absolutely. I think first people would like to have a, really a hand-holding through the first session. Mm -hmm. I think you need, if I've never done this before, I want somebody professional that does this every day, and you have people that do that. When I'm looking at the idea of walking through an existing con uh, existing contract, I love the, what you said the first part, which is maybe they haven't seen the advisor. I cannot believe how many times that issue alone is carrying the day why another person is going to get a shot at this because you aren't doing your annual review. You're not really doing any kind of handholding. There's no actual contact. So I just, as an encouragement to advisors, really part of retaining business is really we just, we've got to make the touch. Mm -hmm. And we just have to get that as part of our protocols and embed it as a discipline. When I go into a contract, and I'm just thinking, I have actually two companies now that are popped into my head. When I'm walking in there, I'm going to be looking for those things that you said, how highly compensated, they're failing the discrimination test. But I want to bring something that we said earlier in the week that I think it was kind of somewhat new to me. I keep thinking of deferred comp in retirement. And a lot of people have other ideas. Like I personally, I'm looking for a retirement home right now. Mm -hmm. The home I'm going to live in until I die. When I'm looking, I didn't know that was part of deferred comp. That could be a deferred comp play. I have another last child heading through college. Mm -hmm. I did not realize tuition. So I think what you did for me early on the week was, whoa, this is way bigger than just retirement. And I can actually start saying I want to save for several things. I can't imagine uh, all the options now as a, as a deferred comp because a lot of people say, hey, you know, I, I really got my, you know, especially the older people in deferred comp, I'm asking this question. Mm -hmm. They seem to be down the road now. So they're going to be going out in maybe five years or so. They're really looking at probably a little more conservative investments. Mm -hmm. But they have things in their mind, actual goals. Maybe it's a retirement home. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, you know, funding a whole other way to get me through till I'm 70 because I don't want to take my RMDs. A lot of options in here. How do you see that? I, I completely agree with you. So what we're going to do is when we do a plan review mm -hmm. on a non-qualified plan, an existing plan, we're going to go through those eight components of um, plan design. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at each one. Eligibility, investments, financing, features and benefits, distributions. And we're going to look at it holistically from all the different um, levels of participation. We're going to say, you know what, for the older folks, do we have adequate retirement savings in there? Or, you know, is there a mm -hmm. retirement gap? Can we help them with some one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. education? 
for the younger folks, do we need to add in-service distributions? Do they need to be saving for college education? So we're going to look at the whole plan, but we're going to look at each segment of it to make sure it's super flexible mm -hmm. and that we have the right features and benefits for the makeup of the organization. Who do I have to be careful if I'm coming into an existing plan that I change the game? Do I have to be careful about that? Absolutely. These plans are governed by 409 Cap A. So you can't accelerate benefits. You can't take things away that participants already have. So mm -hmm. you need to be very, very careful. Things that are easy to change. Investment choices, very easy to change. Mm -hmm. Financing, you know what? We can change financing with no impact to the material content of mm -hmm. the plan design. But things like, you know what, Steve? I gave you a 10-year installment distribution, and now I'm telling you it has to be five. You cannot do that. You mm -hmm. can change things going forward, but oftentimes you cannot go, mm -hmm. go backwards mm -hmm. and change things that are already in place. So I'm going to have to be very mindful mm -hmm. of once I see some openings and some ideas that could be very helpful, I also have to read, will there be any ramifications or consequences of those changes? Absolutely. When we come back in the second segment, I want to talk about 457 plans, some of the nonprofits, and see how this interwines with Deferred Comp. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. We're talking about 457 plans and B and F. Now, I haven't been in this a little while, so why don't you give me the distinction? Well, the 457B plan allow participants and or the employer to make contributions up to 17,500. So it basically mirrors a 403B or 401K. Mm -hmm. What's key about that is regardless of who makes the contributions, there's no vesting. So very simple, easy plan design. They don't have as much flexibility as they do in the for-profit space. On the 457F side, this is governed by 409A, so very, very important to be compliant. Um, it allows the employer to make a discretionary employer contribution on behalf of an individual. It can be designed as a defined benefit or a defined contribution mm -hmm. plan. Again, defined contribution is definitely the more popular. Here's the deal. It is 0% vested until a triggering date. So let's say, for example, I say, Steve, I'm going to give you $25,000 a year, and when you hit 65, you are vested. When you vest, you get the full, you have to pay, take it as a lump sum distribution and pay your taxes at that point in time. So there's no installment distributions. The key is if you leave at 64, you get nothing. Mm. It's an all or nothing vest. So these are much more restrictive than what we see in the for-profit space. In nonprofit, which is the pop more popular of the two? Mm -hmm. It really depends. I would say if we're looking for a way to overcome some limitations or help some highly comps save in general, we're going to layer on just a very simple, easy 457B plan. Mm -hmm. If we really want to do something special for somebody key to the organization, we're going to go with a 457F. This has unlimited contribution limits, so I can literally create any type of plan design I but want. But you have that one caveat, though. You have a certain time event. If you don't do it, you lose it all. I mean, It's an all or nothing vest. Now, what you can do is there's no restrictions on how many plans you have. So I could say, you know what, Steve, I'm going to have three plans. Some of it's going to vest, and you're going to get paid out at age 55. Some oh. will vest, and you get paid out at age 60. And some will be age, um, six, you know, further on down the line. So there's no limitation on how many of the 457F plans you have. Correct. And they can, they can actually vest in steps. It could be a two, four, five, seven year, whatever you need. Correct. You got to be careful because you don't want to create this illusion that we've created an installment payout, right? Mm -hmm. So they got to be separate and distinct plans. The other thing that I like about the 457F plan, remember back when we used to do CERT plans and I'd take out an insurance policy mm -hmm. on you and at the end I just transfer it for value? Oftentimes with 457F, that's how we design them, right? I take a policy out on you. UL, VUL, IUL, whatever works for you. And then at the end, after making contributions, you vest, I give you the policy, you pay your taxes, and now you have an I'm paying asset. my taxes on the cash value or the interpolator reserve. What am I paying my taxes on? Whatever the uh, benefit amount I give you. So mm -hmm. if it's the cash value or I've kept a separate account that, you know, that mm -hmm. excludes the insurance cost, then I pay whatever I'm... And I whatever. paid in that year, I take constructive Correct. receipt. Correct. There's no installment payments in a 457F plan. You know, in 457F plans, then, do you see, is there more traditional investments like mutual funds and so forth versus uh, insurance products, maybe annuities or life insurance? You know, it depends. Again, um, if I'm doing it in conjunction with a 401K plan, mm -hmm. oftentimes I'll see investment choices and often more times in the 457B. In the 457F, because it's usually a handful mm -hmm. of key employees, I oftentimes see an insur insurance solution, and it just depends on the age of the participant and how much risk tolerance we want to give them. But it's more insurance-based. 
We have a lot of advisors that uh, have really, really good inroads into charities. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to be bringing another an option here, I think, and one that I think could get them in because most people already have the existing client. They're going to let them in the door. If you had to propose a basic first contact, I'm going to talk about something that you can add to what you're already doing in charitable giving, how would I go about introducing a concept like this? As far as charitable giving goes, um, here's the nice thing about this. So let's say you put in a 457 plan, 457B, 457F. Technically, if we finance it with insurance, the company is the owner and the beneficiary of that policy. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, what we'll see is, you know what, nonprofits don't usually use insurance because they don't need the tax leverage. However, if we can leave an endowment to the organization through that death benefit that's uh, part of the mm -hmm. insurance policy, oftentimes the um, nonprofits like that as well. Well, now, is the death, if I'm leaving as the highly comped employee, I have my cash value, mm -hmm. I'm paying my taxes on in the year, to, are they keeping the death benefit? Are we splitting this benefit? They can. So the rule in deferred compensation is the company is the owner and the beneficiary of whatever asset you Day set up. Day one. Day one. And I can also endorse, if it's insurance, I can endorse a portion of the death benefit to the participant if I want to while they're mm -hmm. employed. When they separate from service, I owe them money. How I pay that is completely up to the organization. So I can say, you know what, I'm keeping that policy on you and at some point down the road, if something happens to you, I'm going to get the benefit from it. Or I can say, you know what, I'm not going to maintain that policy anymore. I'm just going to transfer it for value. So the organization has mm -hmm. that decision, that choice to make when they make the distribution. But they could actually keep the death benefit and the employee could actually part with the cash value. That's right. Well, see, to me, that's a huge, there's another flexibility uh, mm -hmm. issue there, and I love the options. In the more traditional 457B where I'm mirroring, it looks like a 401k and all this, do you see any advantage of introducing, even though they're already using funds, is there any insurance advantage in introducing insurance products? Here's the way I look at it is I think it's always the advisor's responsibility mm -hmm. to outline all the different choices, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the pros and cons of each one. And you know what, let the, let the plan sponsor mm -hmm. select that. They may have a specific reason for key person insurance that they want to cover on one or more of their key employees. Or they might say, you know what, mutual funds works great for mm -hmm. us. So I think it's our responsibility as advisors to give the client all the options. And that way you protect yourself if somebody comes in behind you and says, you know what, mm -hmm. you never talked to me about insurance. Well, you know what, you've covered all your bases. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? Just hop out to our site, downtobusiness.ashbrokers.com. Want to email me? Steve at downtobusiness.tv. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage Advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you next week.